In this series, we speak to inspirational people who are working in global health. They share their journeys about where in the world they have worked, the issues they are passionate about, and how they got involved. Whether they are students, young professionals, or established in their careers, they all have one thing in common, to change this world for the better. Coming up in this episode, we speak to Professor Anne Matthews, who talks to us about her role as the chair of the Irish Global Health Network. She talks of her experience of working and living in Malawi and also studying and teaching as a nurse and a midwife. The step to go to Malawi, which, you know, I wasn't sure at all. Uh, and I learned so much and gained so much as a human being that I would never have foreseen that. And at times I was lonely, all those things. But you just say, OK, you know, just keep going. Here's another day and here's something good to do today. Um, so just to do that and it will lead to kind of unforeseen, uh, you know, personal and then professional. And you hope some other impacts on others. So good morning, everybody. I'm absolutely delighted to be welcoming Anne Matthews to uh, to the show today. Um, Anne Matthews will be known to many. She has been a member of the board of the Irish Global Health Network since 2015, and she's been chairperson since July 2017 and is soon about to hand over that responsibility. Anne qualified as a nurse and a midwife, and then she undertook a social science degree at UCD, followed by a master's in social policy and planning at the London School of Economics. She also teaches, she's a professor and a chairperson on the BSc Health and Society Programme in the School of Nursing, Psychotherapy and Community Health at DCU. And she completed her PhD there on midwifery empowerment, and she's worked there for 20 years. Her current research is evaluating evidence-based infant feeding policy implementation in Malawi. And you're so welcome. It's really a pleasure to, uh, to welcome you this morning. Thank you so much. Lovely to talk to you. So, Anne, I'd love to start um, just by learning a little bit. I mean, you've, you've, you've studied in various different places, but you started as a nurse and a midwife. You know, what, what, how, why did you choose nursing and midwifery and, and why did you choose to study where you did? Yeah, when I left school or before I left school, it was all I wanted to do really was to be a nurse. Um, I had worked in a convalescent home in Beaumont where I lived um, in school part time and I just really wanted to be a nurse. And they were the old fashioned days where you were interviewed uh, in each hospital for each place. So the first place I went to the Richmond Hospital in town was called St. Lawrence's Hospitals. Um, colloquially called the Richmond and it moved to Beaumont then after a year so I completed my nurse training in Beaumont uh, worked in Dingle Hospital for a while uh, which I loved and then trained to be a midwife which uh, was a two-year program at the time again I loved that loved everything about birth midwives um, but I suppose there was something in me at the same time that um, later on, when I went to the London School of Economics, their motto is to know the cause of things. And I think as a nurse and a midwife, I, I loved what I was doing, especially midwifery. But there was just something else about people's social situations or their lives or their, you know, how how they came to be, you know, coming in for for a health service and I just was very curious about that I also had a side interest in being a librarian which sounds you know not so uh tied in together but um one way to become a librarian was to do a social science degree at UCD uh, you did library and information studies and I did social policy so I loved the librarian studies I love books I love reading I I worked as a library assistant in the RCSI libraries while I was studying and other weekends I'd work as a nurse so I kept the two things going uh so I yeah and, and a midwife so I kind of that, that was an unusual journey, I suppose, to go back to do full-time social science study. I'm really glad I did. And then at the end of that, I suppose I just had to make a decision. Would I follow the library studies, library and information studies, or, or would I follow the social policy route? And I really wanted to study at the London School of Economics where social policy as a discipline really began about 100 years ago or more. So I I went there to study for a master's. So wow. that kind of confirmed me on that path. 
What an interesting um, tapestry of, of studies. And I know you continue to study and, and you probably will con continue your studies as well. But after you finished your, um, you know, your master's in social policy, you then um, looked towards Malawi. So then you had your, you know, you were equipped as a nurse, as a midwife with social policy and your interest in, in library studies. Um, how did you then take that to Malawi? What did you do? What brought you to Malawi and what did you do while you were there? Yeah, again, that was... Um... You know, it just, I, I worked in UCD in the Department of Social Policy for a while after my master's. And I suppose I began to think about what, what was my next step. And at the time, uh, people might be familiar with the Agency for Personal Services Overseas, APSO, which was uh, an, a piece of the Department of Foreign Affairs in Ireland. And they organized two year volunteer placements. And so I applied to APSO um, and I suppose, I mean, my CV said I was a nurse and a midwife, but I suppose I had moved, I hadn't practiced for long in either of those before doing the social science. And obviously I'd kept up working at the weekends and in a drug crisis clinic in London for a couple of years, but I, they, they picked out the social research part and uh, APSO had sent previous volunteers before me to the Centre for Social Research at the University of Malawi in Zamba, beautiful town in the southern region of Malawi. So I have to say I wasn't very knowledgeable about Malawi. Um, just when I was in college in UCD, I was a mature student and I just found, you know, people call it now you find your tribe, but we had this one world society in UCD and most of the others on the committee, myself and another uh, girl on the committee ran the fair trade uh, stall every week and I had to stop myself buying all the fair trade goods but this was a lovely group there was about eight of us uh, really coming from different backgrounds disciplines and so I suppose when I was in UCD which was a few years before deciding about Malawi I was just you know we used to organize talks uh, by people from Trokra or Goal or Oxfam and campaigns and cultural evenings so I suppose that was when I began to think about that kind of development work um, I went to Cuba on a the Cuba Solidarity um, Brigade uh, there was an anti-imperialist festival so uh, there was all sorts of politics involved things I again I, I I don't think I knew what I was getting into but it was fantastic again great groups of people uh, great experiences and that kind of dip my toe in the water now that was only a few weeks but that was the previous summer so I applied to APSO and you're kind of at the mercy then of, you know, wherever has said, look, we'd like another volunteer with APSO. So I, I landed over in Malawi um, and like I was a real home bird before that. So it was a really big wrench. Um, I'd lived in London for a few years, but that was easy enough. Um, and Malawi was a big step. So, you know, I went over with a, a lovely uh, country director who met me in the airport. Really, for me, that was really important. And we're still really good friends. And um, she kind of set the, the tone in a way for me and the um you know how, how how to live in another country how to enjoy the experience uh Bernadette who works with Concern now and you know she really kind of set me up on my feet and um, but then you know it's pretty much then you're on your own you're going into work um and just fan like fantastic colleagues I was I suppose what I was to bring was a kind of a health policy uh you know some experience but Honestly, I I was like I was a novice really. Um, so I, you know, had certain skills, certain experiences, but like the team was fantastic. Uh, all the all the researchers, there was, you know, there were huge research teams. So pretty much straight away I was kind of put on projects, you know, you run this project, you know, about the public's perception of the police, you know, in the post kind of Banda era. Another one would be about nursing and midwifery schools in rural areas. So kind of another was about adolescent girls literacy and health, uh, health knowledge. So, you know, the, the projects were amazing. I pushed myself out of my comfort zone for sure. Uh, you know, you had to just get on the road and take the advice of those around you uh, you know rely on those around you a lot um, and I came home and back you know uh, over the years but it really was a turning point I suppose for me and um, you know anyone who's been to Malawi knows how beautiful the country is how you know it's it's just you know a really really such a positive experience for me um, 
and yeah that that was my <laughs> my move to Malawi and then you know when you're talking about you know so so the years that you spent there different projects that must have brought you in contact with different groups of people and obviously when you're you know that kind of young age it's so so formative what you're learning what you pick up you know what did you take back with you then to Ireland when you came back like if you were to summarize the kind of key learnings and often they're not about the things we think we're going to learn I mean what were the key things that you took back that then just became part of who you were and part of everything that you did from then till now well that's such an interesting question and I don't think I live this fully but patience I think I learned a little bit more patience and it was because I kind of put myself in situations you know where I'd get on a bus up the north in Mizuzu where Colm who I traveled out with was a midwife um, and you'd get on a bus and the, you know the bus would break down and then you get on another bus and then another bus and I think I you know I'd, you'd have like a 24-hour bus trip and just for me when I'm here at home now in Dublin and I'm frustrated about something you know something won't work I just do think just you know calm down and just think about how you know how well things work generally speaking um I suppose as well I think you know I'm back working with colleagues in Malawi now at the the Kamuzu College of Nursing and again just a very you know respectful approach you know to meetings to communication um whereas I feel when I was back here that you know things are often quite pressurized or maybe people are you know just a little bit too much in a hurry um, and just you know in the in the kind of slow patient communication uh, it's it's what I love I suppose more than anything um, I suppose I learned to work I worked with a lot of research teams where I would be the trainer the trainer of the trainers and then people would go out and do field work and again it was you know really trusting people so I was speaking English uh, mostly people spoke Chichewa in the region we were in so you know it was kind of trusting that you know you're you're, you're doing your best and then other people are going to do their best and really kind of just trusting others um, and not being able to control that because I couldn't and that was a good thing so um yeah just really enjoying working with people um just you know never sure that things would work out you know with the water work I I suppose I lived and I was really you know as a volunteer I had a house that was really comfortable but you know I had no you know there was no television situation I would have come from you know watching television I did get a mobile phone after about a year and I did get a car and um, myself after about a year just to move around so they were good things but in the years I didn't have a phone you know I'd go down and book my call home in the post office and the excitement of that and um, so yeah and you know you know my dad did did get sick while I was away and I had to come home in a really big hurry and I suppose I and then he was fine but I suppose I had always worried what if something happened to somebody and because it did then I thought you know that's okay you know I, I got home and you know everything worked out okay that time so you know it just gave me a bit more courage maybe then to just do things and you know not to just not do things because you fear something might go wrong right right and you know you're you're working as you said back with people in Malawi again now um, and I know now you're 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 very passionate about infant feeding and policies around infant feeding and I just wonder can you say a little bit about that I mean what are some of the issues around um, infant feeding both in Malawi and also interested to see how that then relates back here in Ireland yeah it really is a global issue I suppose breastfeeding you know is recommended for all babies up to six months and that they would only get breast milk and then that all babies will be fed up to two years of age with other foods from six months and it's it's not that it's not a simple issue so there is a choice issue for women to breastfeed or not but I suppose there's there are so many barriers to women breastfeeding there's the kind of formula milk kind of industry and all of that marketing, which is, you know, there, there, there are, there's a code in place for a long time to, to stop that. Some countries have brought in legislation to support that. 
Um, and there's all the social, cultural kind of issues um, that kind of prevent women maybe being able to, to breastfeed. And I suppose hugely then there's the lack of support uh, for women before they give birth, around the time they give birth and afterwards, and especially when people are at home. So um, that did lead me back to my uh, my PhD because I had studied as a midwife and I, I felt slightly unresolved about what midwives were supposed to do. So I I... When I came back to Ireland in 2000, I registered for a PhD in 2001 as part of my job in DCU to really look at what was the role, what is the role of the midwife internationally and in Ireland? And I suppose to what extent are they able to fulfill that? So in my PhD, I developed a, a scale to measure the empowerment in mid for midwives. So uh, just really what are the kind of conditions, what kind of support do midwives themselves get? How are they able to advocate for women? Um, and, you know, I, I gave birth around the same time and I was thinking, oh, I should be focusing on empowerment for women giving birth. But I actually thought, you know, if, if women don't have empowered midwives, you know, they, they're not going to be empowered. And, you know, it's a really complex idea of empowerment, but it does mean giving power to or handing over power. So midwives, you know, in Ireland definitely work in a very medicalized way. Uh, you know, system and structure. Uh, we have a good maternity strategy that just hasn't been implemented. But then in Malawi, I suppose the difference is, and you know, lots of other countries, most women do breastfeed to start with. And so most women, you know, often, you know, 90% or higher of women breastfeed at some stage, whereas in Ireland, that would be much lower in the 40% and then drops off very quickly. But in Malawi and other countries, I suppose the issue does arise about you know, bringing in water and other fluids and liquids and even solids, you know, quite early. And some of those issues are based on traditional beliefs. Uh, they're often based on this idea that the mother hasn't got enough milk. And this is another way of saying women aren't, you know, enough. Uh, so and that's played on, I suppose, by the by the companies who, who produce these kind of products. But in Malawi, you know, we, we heard on our first visit there for this project that you know, babies aren't really being breastfed fully until the six months. Um, and while in Ireland or another developed country where women do have access, usually, but not everybody to clean water that they can boil and make formula, and they hopefully, you know, can can guarantee themselves a supply of that formula. It is expensive. Uh, and so not all women can do that, even in developed countries. But in developing countries, that's, you know, in rural areas and in in situations of difficulty and poverty that's virtually impossible so you're not replacing breast milk with something that's safe so mm. I suppose that just brings me back to this kind of evidence-based uh, kind of approach um, I've been involved with systematic reviewing and other other evidence synthesis kind of methods looking at what is the evidence for this so mm. I suppose the evidence for exclusive breastfeeding is really clear and it's been known for a long time but I suppose we're just trying to look at some of the policies that would help support that and uh, happens to be in Malawi with our partners there but then we'd love to to see how that kind of mm -hmm. could, could be rolled out to other places mm, just listening to you as um as a woman as well like having breastfed uh, my two children I had my two children in Thailand and where breastfeeding was you know everybody breastfed it was the thing to do and I remember coming back to Ireland with them and and it being not uh, the, the environment didn't feel the same it didn't feel like it was a kind of a welcome, you know, public, um, acceptable uh, thing to do. I just remember, uh, remember that. So what an important issue that you're working on. Um, and then, of course, in your work now, you are you have you know, the joy, I imagine, of, of teaching um, our, you know, the younger generation uh, running the course that you run on health and society. What are the kind of things that you teach around global health um, to these students? And, and how do you think it's changing their view of the world? Yes, thank you. I suppose I'm so fortunate in that we were able to develop um, at DCU the BSc in Health and Society. So we've had 10, uh, 10 groups of students uh, over the years, which is fantastic. And they, you know, they, they come to us with a kind of a passion for health, you know, improving health, 
uh, looking at the conditions that affect people's health and really looking at health inequalities and how we could overcome them. So again, I feel so lucky that in the first uh, year with the students, I look at um, you know, what are the things we need for health that are, are claimed to be scarce. So water is scarce, food is scarce, but they're not really. They're usually uh, you know, controlled by somebody. Somebody doesn't have them, somebody does have them. And that's not like an absolute scarcity. It's more an, an inequality. So uh, again, I kind of bring in the sustainable development goals there. Uh, you know, students choose a sustainable development goal to, to do a short video about. So, you know, the students are creative and we know that. So from the word go uh, that comes in, they use electronic portfolios to present their work. And um, then in second year, I've, I again, I'm lucky to have a module on campaigning for health equity, where students choose a topic and they run a campaign to, again, not not really just a health promoting campaign, like an awareness campaign, but trying to look at, again, the causes behind health inequalities or the causes of the causes. Uh, and then in third year, I have a global health module and it's called Challenging Global Health Problems. And I suppose it, it's about the problems themselves being challenging and then how we can challenge them. So we usually have verbs in our, our modules so that there's a kind of an element of action. So again, within that students focus on a very particular global health issue of concern to them. It could be, you know, maternal vitamin A deficiency or, you know, or it could be iron deficiency, anemia in pregnancy or, you know, whatever issue they're interested in. Um, we cover, you know, HIV, TB, malaria, maternal, newborn child health, adolescent health, uh, and increasingly the non-communicable diseases as they impact on uh, populations in low income countries. And I suppose COVID-19 has overshadowed everything. Uh, and yet, as we see, it affects again, those who are, you know, least are, are most vulnerable in the first place or least prepared for, for such uh, a pandemic. So, um, yeah, so students do great work. I suppose we really focus on those kind of underlying issues, as you've mentioned, like gender um, and then things like water sanitation and hygiene education. So really trying to think about, you know, root causes of problems uh, globally. And yeah, it's always really interesting. We, we say the course starts at the cell and ends at the global level. And hopefully that's that's what the students experience. Mm. And just thinking about, um, you know, the global level and, um, you know, you've been an incredible chair in the Irish Global Health Network um, for, for the last few years. And as I mentioned, you're, you know, you're just about to hand over that um, that position. Uh, you know, when you look at all of the things that you've you've learned and you, you, you know, you've been such a good leader on that. What do you think are some of the key issues that are facing us now in Ireland as global health professionals? What are the key things and what should we be really, you know, focusing on in the next few years as a network? Yeah, great question. Um, I think there's such evidence even coming out in the last couple of days that collective action does make a difference. So, for example, the, the question of, of vaccines globally and vaccine inequity. So I think sometimes it goes back to that, you know, never feel you can't make a difference. And I think in Ireland, you know, we have a really you know, uh, disproportionately strong community of global health people. Um, and I think we're, you know, globally and then, you know, within Ireland, we really can can link together, which I think the purpose of the Net Global Health Network is to network and inform, uh, connect people. Um, and I know we've been doing that virtually for a year and a bit. And I think we, you know, we've managed, well, you and the team have managed unbelievably to connect people, probably connect people in a different way and sometimes a better way because we've definitely had more interaction, more participation globally. Um, I suppose what I love about the Irish Global Health Network is the informal meetings and the gatherings. So I'm looking forward to us all being together again at conferences, at events, uh, those connections that people make. I think people are very open, very generous. People have been very generous to me over my time, bringing me into the Global Health Network and, you know, and just enabling people to do things at different stages. And there's a lovely focus on students and early uh, career professionals uh, in the IGHN. So I think that's the, the future is safe. And then just on that, um, you know, for the early career professionals and, you know, young people who might be listening to this podcast and thinking about being being, you know, getting involved in global health. What would be your your advice for them or even just a piece of wisdom for them as they just think about their future? 
Yeah, I think like based on my own experience, just to, you know, push yourself a little bit out of your comfort zone, take a step. It could be it could be something that you're not sure about. Obviously, keep safe and all of those things. But, you know, just do something um, and you probably won't regret it. So my trip even to Cuba, if you like, uh, or, you know, or you could say living in London before that. But the, the step to go to Malawi, which you know, I wasn't sure at all. Uh, and I learned so much and gained so much as a human being that I would never have foreseen that. And at times I was lonely, all those things. But you just say, OK, you know, just keep going. Here's another day and here's something good to do today. And um, so just to do that and it will lead to kind of unforeseen, uh, you know, personal and then professional. And you hope some other impacts on others. But it's just the way things kind of loop around because when I came home to Ireland and I was working in DCU and getting on with my DCU job and just opportunities kept coming back up to link with Malawi to link with a lot of universities in South Africa and particularly Durban University of Technology and just you know that that kind of connected back with me and has really sustained me and will, will sustain me through the rest of my career so just taking a step at one point uh, will kind of lead to unforeseen uh, other other directions mm. thank you and thank you so much it's been such a pleasure um, just just having this conversation stopping and having this conversation with you such a pleasure and you know the legacy that you leave uh, for all of us in the Irish Global Health Network will just last um, from for many many years and thank you for for sharing yourself with us today uh, it's really a privilege thank you Nadine it's a pleasure So thank you for joining us today. If you want to know more or get involved in the Irish Global Health Network, then go to our website. You can sign up for free to become a member at www.globalhealth.ie. And we very much look forward to the next episode.